everyone. On behalf of Cornell Cooperative Extension and Pro Dairy, I would like to welcome you to our Hoof Health and Lameness Program. My name is Casey Havikus. I am one of the Dairy Management Specialists on Cornell Cooperative Extension North Country Regional Ag Team, and I will be serving as your host for today. Okay, so finally, we have Dr. Jan Shear joining us today. Dr. Shear is the Dairy Extension Veterinarian at Iowa State University College of Veterinary Medicine. Dr. Shear has several decades of experience in training producers on the best approaches to managing lameness in cattle. He established the Master Hoof Care Program, which is a training program designed to teach on-farm employees how to properly trim and treat hoof and foot problems. Since 1996, this program has acquired international prominence for its impact on foot health and dairy operations. We are great, very grateful to have Dr. Shear here joining us today to end the program with a discussion on effective lameness detection and locomotion scoring. Well, thanks again for the opportunity to be a participant in, the, in this program. My objective here is going to be to review lameness scoring uh, very quickly, and then the identification of some common lameness conditions. Lameness is a very broad, complicated subject. It's um, really a, a large number of conditions that can cause lameness. I tend to break it down, as I say here, in a nutshell. We know that we have larger herds today, better performance, more confinement housing, and, and that contributes to the claw disorders uh, those that are associated with the hoof itself, the hard flooring surfaces, and metabolic disease disorders or metabolic conditions, not necessarily disease, are part of the uh, pathogenesis of, of these particular conditions. And, and we also know that, of course, in addition to ulcers and white line disease that are common disorders of the claw, we can also develop uh, from time to time, foreign bodies and also excessive wear is a pretty significant problem in many of our very large uh, dairies today. Then the other disorders that have been addressed quite nicely here earlier is um, constant exposure to nursery and moisture, we believe contributes to conditions such as digital dermatitis and foot rot. And then the other one that we aren't talking about, but generally refers to or generally contributes to maybe somewhere between that five to ten percent of all, all cases that occur in herds would be upper leg uh, lameness conditions and so it is a broad subject indeed so detection becomes critically important to us and we have a number of ways to go about this but uh, let's talk a little bit about locomotion scoring uh, as a way that we can uh, identify and detect lame cows. Um, determining the prevalence of lameness is one way we can use locomotion scoring. It is used, of course, in welfare assessments and audits, but we can also use it for early detection of lameness because uh, we're picking up on uh, behaviors in animals uh, that uh, may be existent before the actual favoring of one limb or, or another uh, occurs. So we're looking for an abnormal gait with motion scoring, and sometimes we're relying on these other behaviors, but reliance on the presence of an abnormal gait or behavioral indicator of pain that's associated with locomotion is the objective of locomotion scoring. It's probably more commonly applied in dairy cattle in, in uh, the feed yard uh, setting or, or in market and um, in also packing plant settings. Uh, we have mobility scoring that is another way that we can evaluate foot and leg health. The scores are based uh, primarily on lameness or the inability of animals to keep pace uh, with their groups. And we can use that also in the dairy uh, industry as well, but um, uh, we tend to rely much more on locomotion scoring. And we're looking primarily at um, the behavioral indicators of lameness, this would include head bob, for example, or shortening or lengthening of the stride, uh, changes in the degree of abduction, that is the outward positioning of a leg or positioning it closer to the body, uh, tracking, which is that situation where the hind claw is not placed in exactly that same location as uh, the front claw, 
uh, in the initiation of the stride. That's an important one to, to look at and, and to monitor. Changes in the alignment of the pin bones uh, can also be uh, useful when viewed uh, from behind. Changes in the animal's willingness to walk. Uh, of course, as we mentioned, this mobility scoring issue can be part of what we uh, can use to monitor early indicators of lameness. And then changes in the stance uh, phase of the stride where the animal uh, maintains more or less weight on the sound or uh, lame limb during the uh, stance phase. We tend to uh, see a lot of uh, locomotion scoring using a five-point scoring system, our four-point uh, scoring systems, and I'll mention a three-point scoring system here in a minute, but the five-point uh, locomotion scoring system is one that pays a special attention to back posture and abnormalities in gait. It was originally developed by Dr. David Sprecher in a study that he did at uh, Michigan State University years ago in evaluating the effect of lameness on reproductive performance. He used the score, as you see here, one through five, and I think most are familiar with this, uh, where the clinical description of a locomotion score one is a normal cow, stands and walks with a level back posture, her gait is normal, all the way down to that severely lame animal that uh, demonstrates a, an inability or extreme reluctance to bear weight uh, on one or more limbs. And the difference between these as we go down through there from two to three, for example, of a cow with a locomotion score of two uh, will stand with a level back, but she arches her back as she begins to walk. Then when she progresses to stage four, uh, she has an um, arch back, both standing and walking. And so when we get to the differentiation between locomotion score two and three, uh, we're, we're looking at rather subtle changes in addition to uh, a mild change in the gait of this animal. So here we're looking at it, and this has been popularized, of course, by the Zinpro Corporation, who's put together some very nice brochures uh, that kind of uh, describe this, this system here. We're looking at locomotion score one and two. Generally, in these two locomotion scores, we find limited to no real effect on performance, but it may be suggestive that uh, we could be developing a case when this animal uh, could be developing an early case of lameness uh, when this animal uh, moves from this locomotion score two and certainly to locomotion score three, as we see three, four, and five here listed, where the animal has an arch back in all cases here between three, four, and five, and we get a progressively more abnormal gait as we go from three to four, five, which is uh, severely lame, where this animal is, is very limited in its ability to, to move or be mobile, and um, we also see a very uh, obvious, very significant uh, effect on their gait. When we look at these behavioral indicators of pain and the presence of foot lesions, what we find, at least from one study, which I've always thought was quite interesting, that when we look at arching of the back and the speed of gait, um, tracking of the feet, position of the head, rotation of the feet, these kinds of um, behavioral indicators, we find that arching of the spine does in fact carry the highest uh, correlation coefficient. In other words, 55% of the time uh, that an animal has uh, an arch in her back, uh, we might expect to see something in her foot as well. I think the important thing there though is that it's not 100%. We need to keep that in mind when we're uh, utilizing locomotion scoring uh, systems and particularly the back posture. Um, there is some degree of error and we can't rely solely on that for determining uh, whether an animal is lame or not. The Sprecher system, of course, emphasizes the spinal posture, the arching of the back, but 45% of the cows in the study that I just shared with you with an arch back, we're likely not to have a lameness problems. And so this is an important thing to remember, but the other thing to remember is uh, that when we were looking, we're looking at this five point system, we need to see this cow standing and walking. And quite oftentimes when we're 
doing locomotion scoring, uh, we see this animal moving only. And so we need to keep in that in mind because there will certainly be some degree of misclassification between a two or a three uh, using that system alone, simply because we're not necessarily looking at these animals uh, standing and walking, but usually uh, just seeing them as walking. The other thing that I think we see, and I think these are still very effective systems, as long as we keep in mind some of the limitations. But we noticed that in the farm program, we use a three-point scoring system. And basically, it's equivalent to the system that we just looked at. It's a matter of uh, scores one and two being combined to form a score of one, for example. Score three would fit into that score two uh, in the farm program scale. And scores four and five uh, will be a score three on the farm program system. So one of the handicaps with that, or one of the things that we need to keep in mind using it this way, is that uh, farm program uh, guidelines state that 95% or more of lactating and dry cows must score a two or less, which kind of suggests, of course, that you know 95% or so of the lactating and dry cows uh, can be lamed, which is a bit of a frustration in, in the use of that system. But uh, I think that that is one of the limitations to that uh, collapsing of these scores from the five, program, five point program to a three point uh, scale. And we need to keep that in mind as well as a possible limitation to this system. So just a very quick and dirty look at locomotion scoring. I think it's very useful, but there are some limitations and that we need to keep in mind with respect to the use of locomotion scoring systems. Paw lesions that cause lameness are these, and these are important. Paw lesions that cause lameness are soul ulcers, white line disease, and traumatic lesions of the soul. These are the ones that we tend to see in, in all claws and the soul primarily, of course. Uh, and these are important ones to have our trimmers uh, identify for us because Having a whole lot of one or other of these conditions obviously leads us uh, in a different direction in terms of our um, ability or the kinds of management changes we might need to make uh, in order to address them. For example, a lot of soul ulcers pulling a herd would cause us to need to look at our cow comfort, make sure that we're addressing those issues uh, adequately. Uh, if we're seeing a lot of traumatic lesions in the soul, whether it's a you know, puncture of the soul, uh, or possibly a number of foreign bodies that may be occurring in the soul. And those are indicators also that maybe we need to address this disorder from a different uh, perspective. Maybe we've got a, we've just had recent construction and, and maybe we've got a lot of uh, nails that have ended up on the floor for some reason, or we're not managing that correctly. And then I think the other one that's really important for us to be uh, tracking is thin souls or souls that become thin and develop a, an ulcer in the toe as a consequence of that from excessive wear. Those are critically important uh, conditions. Those are the ones that really cost us uh, when it comes to lameness in cows. So here we're looking here on the left side of the screen here, we see uh, the picture here of a couple of uh, soul ulcers. You notice uh, that they always occur in that one particular spot directly beneath the P3 bone. It's up above, and usually we have some sinking of the bone. We have some other mechanical factors that are playing a part here, whether it's claw horn overgrowth in some cases, whatever it might be. Uh, but soul losses always occur in that location. They don't very often abscess but they always occur in that particular uh, location. On the right side here, we're looking at white line disease, probably the one disease in all of medicine that's been named correctly, white line disease, because it occurs right in the white line and typically uh, in the heel, as you see there in this uh, lower photograph. These are oftentimes very, very uh, involved and need uh, sometimes anesthesia to really trim these out properly because they really become uh, extensive in terms of the damage they do within the cloth. 
<laughs> then we have punctures of the sole. Here we're looking at a puncture of the sole. Uh, if this, um, see the puncture right there, it's inside the white line. So we know this isn't a white line disease situation. Here we have a series of foreign bodies. There's a screw up in the uh, axial wall in the upper left. Uh, here we have a screw that's uh, worked its way in to the white line in the axial wall in the upper uh, right. Uh, we have the tooth, not uncommon for a tooth to end up in the sole as we see there in the lower left. And then of course, hypodermic needles from time to time find their way to soles as well. The other one that is very common for us, and I want you to look at the upper left video, and this is one of the more common conditions we see today. Here we have the hook tester on the uh, medial claw. Now we're moving it to the outer claw of the rear foot, and you see the flexibility of that sole. Uh, that's a very thin sole, and what happens when we look to the right, on the top right there, we see this crack or this fracture in the sole and the separation of the sole away from uh, this white line in the, in the toe there. And that's then what will oftentimes lead to what we're looking at here down in the lower left, what we call a thin sole toe ulcer. These are very common in herds uh, that you know, maybe they put in new facilities and have very new concrete, so they're getting excessive wear. Um, and so those are Im important ones to, to know. We see it oftentimes in the lower right there as a more chronic condition where uh, it's developed into a situation where we've developed an abscess to form beneath the sole uh, in, in, in that region. So this is a very important condition today uh, in our in our large dairies. So ulcers, white line disease, and traumatic lesions of soul are lesions that cause lameness. So what is a soul abscess? And I always get frustrated at times when I'm looking through a set of records and all I see is um, possibly the trimmer has listed soul abscess, soul abscess, soul abscess, and I have no idea for sure what's really going on in that herd. And I can't really address this condition from where I think the underlying causes may be. You see, sole abscess is not a diagnosis, but it's a secondary condition. What I need to know, is it a sole ulcer? Is it a white line disease? Is it a puncture of the sole? For all those reasons I described there, if I'm going to fix those kinds of problems from the point at which they're occurring, then I need to understand if I have a lot of sole ulcers, possibly I've got a comfort issue I need to be addressing. If I have a white line disease problem, possibly I need to look at my flooring conditions a little bit. Possibly I have some flooring conditions that I need to consider. If it's a situation where I'm getting a lot of foreign bodies, then I need to address a condition as well. So claw disorders are extremely important and, and we've gone through those quickly, but I, I think it's important that we keep track of those. And it was mentioned here earlier that we need to track these kinds of conditions. And this is the reason we track these conditions is so we can find the underlying causes and address them at a level before these things can occur. Infectious disorders of the foot and foot skin are extremely important uh, to us as well. We have bovine foot rot. The clinical features of this disease are important to us to recognize in, in all cases. We get this severe necrotic lesion as you're seeing uh, in the interdigital skin here between the two digits, we have a generalized swelling of the foot. That means the whole foot is swollen. It's not just on one side, but it's the entire foot is swollen. Uh, we have a separation of these claws as a consequence of that swelling. And you find animals affected with this that are frequently lift their foot. Uh, you see this swelling from a distance and you can see that uh, there's definitely an infectious process uh, going on there. Uh, and so it's important to, to look at these kinds of things, but it's even more important to take a closer look at these things uh, here in a minute, as I'll share, because there's other factors that we need to be able to rule out uh, when we're looking at swollen feet. So from a distance, we see this generalized swelling that may uh, extend up to and above the dew claws, separation of the claws, very severe lameness, as you can imagine, and a cow that constantly lifts her foot uh, in pain. This has got to be an incredibly painful condition. 
And so we have this foul smelling necrotic lesion in the skin. These cows are often febrile. Uh, they have a fever that will run anywhere from 103 to 105 or so. And they are very, very painful. So this is one that really needs uh, our attention early on. And this is one that needs antibiotic therapy because it is an infectious uh, condition. And so this is one where uh, antibiotic therapy uh, is uh, critically important to it. But then we have these other ones that must be distinguished as well. And here's one of the examples of uh, one of the things when you see a swollen foot, don't make an assumption that it's foot rot, always pick it up, take a look, make sure that you don't have uh, what we're looking at right here, which is a large nail that's embedded in the inner digital uh, area. This is a very deep nail that's gone very deep into this inner digital skin. And this is causing a lot of really uh, severe infection in this particular foot. So always check to make sure. Don't make any assumptions when you see a swollen foot from a distance. Never make any assumptions about that. Always get this cow up, take a closer look, make sure that what you're looking at is foot rot and not some kind of a foreign body. And then we have other complicated claw lesions, deep digital sepsis conditions that are important to recognize as well. These are generally uh, conditions that uh, follow a, a sole ulcer or a white line or even a traumatic lesion of the sole that has gone deeper uh, into the foot and created a deep digital sepsis condition. And if you can look at this particular foot in this cow, you can see that the swelling is confined primarily to one side. It's not a generalized swelling. If you look at this carefully, you'll find that most of the swelling uh, that we're looking at here is confined to this outer claw uh, of this foot. We also see this when we have sepsis of this distal interphalangeal joint. You'll see this swelling above uh, the claw horn capsule or at the coronet. And that is also an extremely important indicator uh, of an infection down inside in the joint itself that really for all practical purpose needs either to be relieved surgically, or in some cases we're looking at euthanasia of the cow because this is one of those conditions that's not gonna get better generally on its own, um, but it's gonna require that we get to the infection in the joint and create uh, a way for that infection to, to leave there. But those require a great deal of time uh, for recovery. Uh, and they also require a great deal of pain management because you can imagine this is an extremely painful condition. And so it's important to recognize these conditions and not confuse these uh, with foot rot because foot rot will generally respond quite nicely to antibiotic therapy, whereas these will not respond uh, to antibiotic therapy. These generally uh, require a surgical uh, intervention of some sort. And here's just another one of those. Uh, this is another type of um, deep digital sepsis condition. And here we're looking at another one that is the consequence of a, a sole ulcer. And it actually ended up here with what we call a retic retroarticular space abscess. And then you look on the lower left there, you can see that this infection is very, very deep uh, up into the foot. It's behind that uh, PT, P2 bone. Uh, which is uh, this bone right here. And it's into what we call the retroarticular space, which is just above uh, the articular space. And these require surgery as well for correction. So we want to be sure that when we're looking at these swollen uh, foot problems, it's important to give these uh, particular attention to be sure that we know what we're dealing with. Digital dermatitis is such an important uh, condition uh, for us as well. Um, where we see so many of these, they should not be uh, misunderstood as uh, not being important. Of course, they're critically important to us. It's the most common infectious disease in cattle. And the other problem about it is it's one of the more difficult ones to manage. Uh, these are chronic lesions of digital dermatitis. We see here this filamentous outgrowth here on the left that we see in a very chronic lesion, a very thickened chronic lesion here on the right. 
Um, it is the most common infectious disease affecting housed dairy cattle worldwide, affects the majority of herds, of course. And it is really an important problem today, growing problem, I would say, if not beyond the growing problem, it's a problem in, in feedlot cattle. Probably one of the most common things that I get called about is digital dermatitis in feedlot cattle. It's clinical appearance of this. Of course, we're all familiar with this. It has this raw red oval ulcer on the back of the heel and develops some erosive and uh, some proliferative or thickening uh, that oftentimes occurs with this that makes it, gives it that kind of that uh, wart-like appearance. And 80% or so of these tend to occur on rear feet. When they occur in front feet, they tend to occur on the front of the foot. Um, but they can be found any place on the foot and foot skin. And it's important uh, to, to recognize them when they get to this point and when they're causing lameness, they need to be uh, treated in some way. Treponemes are most commonly found in these mature and chronic lesions as we're looking at here. Um, their abundance increases as the lesion progresses, but we have find that early on, there's a variety of other bacteria that are involved. And so it's not clear what really is causing this condition, whether it may be a combination of bacteria that initiates this disease, and then that the treponemes become very commonly involved with this lesion late is uh, kind of what we uh, think is, is what's happening. And in late lesions or chronic lesions, we find that 94% of bacterial organisms that are present there are the spirochetes. But early on, it's a little different. And possibly uh, that explains why we haven't been so successful with our, ther our um, abilities to produce vaccines to treponemes to control this disease because it's quite possible that there's other organisms present uh, that are causing this thing. Let's look at lesion progression. I think many of us think that this lesion pops up in a matter of days, but in fact, what we find from some of the studies we've done here at Iowa State that to go from normal skin to mature lesion requires on average somewhere around 130 to 140 days. That's a lot longer than most of us would expect. In fact, there are some, of course, that will occur much quicker than that, as I'll show you here in, in a lesion progression series here. But on average, it takes uh, roughly from the time that these animals go from normal skin, an infected uh, situation where they become exposed, let's say, to the point at which they develop a mature lesion somewhere around 130 to 140 days. So here we're starting day zero. You can see this uh, interdigital cleft area, quite normal at this point starting to develop some degree of erosive activity there. Here again, just a little bit more at day 35. And then by day 60, uh, we have the typical type of lesion. Here we have by day 88, a more typical, uh, progressing to that almost chronic state type lesion. Uh, here we have an even uh, more severe uh, lesion than at day 164. And you see then along with that, the great degree of uh, heel erosion uh, that occurs with that, that's the cracking of the heel horn and so forth that is very typical uh, with digital dermatitis. Treatment and control, one-time topical treatment, tetracycline powder in our study, we treated conditions like you're looking uh, here in the photograph, six of 44, that's 14% of the lesions returned to normal skin and did not reoccur. So you see that if you follow these long enough, what you'll find is that 80 to 85% of these will return. That's the frustrating thing about this particular disease. And that's what is really, I think, problematic about uh, treatment of digital dermatitis. When we looked at foot baths, we found a 3% uh, formula in foot bath was most beneficial in control of these very early lesions as we're looking at here. These are the ones that people never see. So quite oftentimes, uh, people put in a foot bath uh, expecting to change that more chronic or that more mature kind of type of lesion, reducing it to normal skin after a very short period of time. In fact, that just doesn't happen. What we find that in most cases, it has very little effect on mature and more chronic kinds of lesions. In fact, what we're really seeing is 
possibly over time, some decrease in the overall prevalence uh, of this disease. Um, but in fact, uh, we don't really um, affect those mature and chronic lesions because foot baths or even topical treatment doesn't tend to make dramatic differences in those, not like we would like. So what we treat these for, and the reason for treating them is, is because from a welfare perspective and, and also from a performance standpoint, uh, if we treat these, whether it's with topical treatment or with foot baths, we can reduce, reduce some of the lesion pain following treatment and uh, make these animals more comfortable. And that should give us some benefits performance-wise. But recurrence rates are high, and that's what we need to keep in mind. So that's the take home on, they, on uh, treatment of DD. We treat these mature and chronic lesions to reduce pain, a small percentage, 15% or less, will return to normal skin. I think the advantage in dairies is that if we treat long enough with foot baths, as we talked about there earlier today, uh, we can keep these at bay and gradually over time, maybe even have some effect on these mature and more chronic kinds of lesions. But early going wise with uh, topical treatment of these lesions, don't expect to see a great deal uh, of change. But failure to treat allows continued suffering that reduces the welfare and performance of affected animals. Foot baths are critically important. And, and But keep in mind that they're most effective for controlling early lesions and over time uh, should reduce the overall prevalence of the disease.